Amen. Thank you for that song. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to Psalm 51. Psalm 51. While you're turning there, this is uh, getting ready for revival coming up in just a few days. Starts on actually the 10th, which is Saturday, and there's a lot of getting ready for all of that. And uh, this Wednesday night, we'll actually set the big tent up. And if you've never been a part of that, we'd love to invite you to stay with us after church this Wednesday night. And man, if you'll bring some gloves and sledgehammer, we'll set that thing up. And it will just take uh, just not long, half hour, 45 minutes maybe. And uh, do it when the sun goes down, be a little cooler for all of that. And if you'll turn me up here, give me all you can give me right up here, that'd be great. And uh, then a special guest this Wednesday night is Dr. Bobby Robertson from Walkertown, North Carolina this Wednesday night. And he'll be in town, and I want you to. How many ever heard Brother Bobby preach? Brother Bobby, he is 80-something, uh, been in ministry 60 years. We're going to honor him that night. And uh, we had a chance to honor Dr. Raymond Barber a few weeks ago for 65 years ministry. And I think Brother Bobby's been in ministry, and that's what he wants to be called, Brother Bobby. Just call me Brother Bobby. And you'll see why when we get him in here. And uh, we'll honor him on Wednesday night. And by the way, I don't know if Brother Pearson has told the choir yet, but we're going to have a choir this Wednesday night. I want Brother Bobby to hear our choir. So if you're in the choir, be in the choir. As he says, choir. Once you're in the choir now. And uh, right out of Mayberry, North Carolina. And I uh, want you to hear uh, him this Wednesday night. Let's fill up the church, the house of God. You're going to enjoy hearing him preach. That's this Wednesday night. And then uh, for you ladies, the fall retreat. There's information out there about that. The 23rd to the 24th of September. Miss Sheila Snyder is the guest speaker. And uh, you'll uh, want to sign up out at the information desk for that. We'll say more about that tonight. And then uh, there's a lot of activity regarding our fall retreat, especially on that Saturday, because we kind of use that as a homecoming. And th those of you who have been here, we started this years ago when we first came to the church, and we went and got a tent. We own the tent now, and it's huge. Uh, but we uh, will have the games for the kids. It uh, starts about 3 o'clock on Saturday. So you want to just mark that in your calendar. and Everybody roll in here about 3 o'clock. There's something for the older folks, horseshoes or whatever you all do. And uh, moving right along. And then uh, we'll feed everybody. It'll be a great menu. That's all free. And then about 6.30, we'll have singing under the tent. We'll start. And the Clark family from New Jersey will be back with us by popular demand uh, this, uh, for this revival being through Tuesday. And so uh, be praying about all of that and be praying for our speakers. There's information out in all the tables there in the lobby area. You pick up that information. Be praying for praying for the preachers especially, that God would just empower them and uh, that we'd have a great meeting under the tent. I think it'd be wise to start praying for some cooler weather too, you know. It'd be nice to have that little fall nip in the air when we got underneath there. That'd be wonderful. And you ladies want to pick up information for the baking contest. Let's stand together, please, for reading God's Word. I'm sorry about all that. I'm trying to work it all in today and still uh, get you out of here before you're, you, you get hungry on me, and sleepy on me. <clears throat> Now, we are entering into a period here at our church. We've asked you to seek revival in your heart. I'm asking you as your pastor to seek revival in your heart. It's not going to be automatic. We'll have to go after it, go after it hard. And I've been preaching along those lines. I will today as well. We're asking God for a local church revival here. We're asking God for a national revival. How many believe we need a national revival in America? I saw again today we're target. Uh, still headstrong about their decision regarding uh, bathrooms and all of that and how they have uh, dropped way down, but they're still going after it. And uh, they're going to now have a big day, 10% off and all that. And I'll just tell you, that's just a little drop in the bucket to let us know how, how bad we need revival. It's not really the peripheral things that you and I are seeing like that. It's the churches that are empty. It's Christians that, that, that they, they sin. There's no difference between a Christian sinning and the world sinning. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to be very blunt with you. When we got saved, the Bible says that old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. We're not saved by our works, but there ought to be a change that we desired when we got saved, let alone the change that occurs after we get saved. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Now, I'm going I'm I'm to say right now, I'm going to hit the heart of it right now today. And uh, there's one thing I know about revival, and that is this, that sin must be dealt with on an individual, personal level first. 
then on a church level, <clears throat> and then on a national level. And sin must be repented of. We'll make much to say about that in order for God to come down and bless. Some of you may know, and I'm going to read the scripture in just a minute, but Second Chronicles 7.14, if you know that, would you quote that with me together? Second Chronicles 7.14, ready? If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn for the wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal the healer land. There's another verse. Listen to what he says. Listen to this. Now, next verse, now, mine eyes shall be open and my ears attent unto the prayer that is made in this place. Right here is where it starts. Right here. And God is looking right now for repentant hearts all across this land. Now, with that in mind, let's begin reading verse number 1 of Psalm 51. Psalm 51 is a, re is a psalm of repentance and confession and then the forgiveness of God that floods the soul of David when it occurred. You'll notice in some of the preliminary remarks, it is to the chief musician, a psalm of David, when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. That may not be in your Bibles. That's just a little extra commentary in my Bible. But that's how this psalm was written, look at verse number 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the mul multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me truly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I, have, I acknowledge my transgressions <clears throat> and my sin is ever before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. That, of course, is the truth that we're all born into sin. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and then the hidden part <clears throat> thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. I'll draw your attention to verse number 6. I would like for you to read that with me together in unison, chapter 51, verse 6. Let's read that together. Ready? Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. That little phrase there, truth, <clears throat> in the inward parts. Way down deep, God is working. And I want to work today. Let's pray together. Father, you taught us that your word is sharper than any two-edged sword, dividing. And I pray today that your word will act as a spiritual scalpel. Tear away the flesh and the nature of sin and get to our inward parts. Take out that which is about to metastasize, that which is about to ruin <clears throat> our reputation, our testimony, that which could cause us to lose our family, that which could manifests itself and lead others down a sin path and even destruction in hell. Help us to see it as you see it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you. may be seated today. The message is very serious. The message is very pointed. It's very personal. <clears throat> Just the other day, my wife and I was eating in a restaurant and, uh, I'm picky, not that she's not, but I mean, I walk in a place, if it smells like that milk's been spilled on the kitchen floor for like 10 weeks, I'm ready to go out the door. So I walk in this place and uh, immediately I kind of, I don't, I'm not smelling fresh food, okay? So my wife said, we're in a hurry, come on. And so we went over and took our seat. 
The next thing I unwrapped my silverware and on it was dried food and residue. <laughs> Again, she said, can you use the other fork? Which had been stacked on the one fork. So uh, I cleaned them up best way I could and I ate. But you know where I'm heading. I was a happy camper. And thank God I didn't get sick and all that. You know what I'm talking about. You look inside a cup that's not clean. You're not going to drink out of that because we understand that we are putting something that is unclean down into our inward part of our body and we know the likelihood that that may harm us the hours and maybe days ahead. At times you become sick from something that you've ingested. When that happens, you immediately know that something is wrong down deep in your soul. Down in the pit of your stomach, you begin to become queasy. There is a physical reaction for that. And you know the truth. You know what you did. And you tried your best to remedy that. I will not go into detail of that, but you know what I'm talking about. How many you know what I'm talking about? All right? That is true spiritually as well as physically. There is a place down deep inside of every person here that no one knows about but you and God. The heart, the Bible says, is desperately wicked. Who can know it? God knows it. I'm talking about a place down inside of you your spouse does not know, your parents do not know, your kids can't see it, your coworkers have no idea. Only you and God know about the thoughts that you hold deep in your soul. And only you and God know if you're pure in the matter of sin or if you're lodging some sin down in the inward parts. Inward parts. In the Bible, the inward parts speaks of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. And Bible writers were writing by inspiration. That's how they described what goes on inside of us. And I've talked about the heart before, and I'm not going to detail about it again today, but we even know as modern human beings that you can get yourself all tore up inside when something stressful occurs. I, I will tell you that Bible writers knew that, and they believed that the heart of a person best reflects that real person, that total person. In other words, the real life walking, talking to you is that soul inside of you that sometimes is described as your heart, but it's the real you. It's the part that nobody sees unless you choose to uh, allow it to manifest on the outside or if by some mistake it happens to, the real you just happens to slip out and, I mean, ah, all of a sudden the claws come out, you know, and you don't realize it. God desires truth in the inward parts, and what it means is he desires a clean heart, verse 10. Psalm 51 was written by David after he had committed adultery with Bathsheba. You can read all about it in the Old Testament, the Second Samuel chapter 11 and 12. And for many days, David tried to cover all that up, all that sin. His thought was that no one knows but me and Bathsheba, and because I'm the powerful king, she'll never tell it. He then secretly has Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, has him killed there on the battlefield. And David felt now that uh, he was home free, that no one would ever know. And he could marry Bathsheba and all of his sin would be completely covered up. But listen now, God knew. God knew. And be sure your sin will find you out. God always knows. And God spoke to Nathan David's preacher and told him everything that David had done and then God tells Nathan said I want you to go I want you to go confront him confront David regarding his sin and today I think about how David confesses before God how God forgives but David waited too late for God to stop his chasing hand God had forgiven, but the wheels of judgment had already started. And today, I want to help us understand the importance of having truth in the inward parts. Now, later on, I'll go into some of the things that David had to deal with because of that. And by the way, tonight, I'm going to be preaching on some of this as well. I hope you'll come back tonight and get it all. But I want you to notice several things. First of all, 
as we talk about uh, getting, having truth in the inner parts. And that's what God desires. God wants a truthful relationship with you. In order for that to happen, number one, there should be a discovery of sin. Would you write that down? There should be a discovery of sin. Look at verse number 3. It says, For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. There was a discovery of sin, and, and sadly, it took the preacher to come and expose the sin. But here's what David already knew. David already knew he sinned the moment he sinned. But he covered it up, and you and I know that as well, especially God's people. We see several things, first of all, here. We see the nature of sin. Look at verse number 5, the nature of sin. He says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. That, that's talking about David while he was being, he was conceived. By the way, a birth starts, life starts at conception. Let me say that again. Life starts at conception. God forbids abortion. Amen, preacher. That's good preaching right there. Now, but, but nevertheless, he said, he said, uh, I, I was born in sin. My mama was a sinner. My daddy was a sinner. By the way, all of us are sinners unless we're saved and we're just sinners saved by grace. And we see the nature of sin. I want you to understand that in, in the discovery of sin, you need to understand that everybody has the ability to sin. That's because we're all sinners uh, by nature. And the Bible bears this out. Romans chapter 3, verse 10. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Uh, Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans chapter 5, verse 12, uh, bears out this verse in verse number 5 of chapter 51. says, Romans 5, 12, wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so then death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. That means that you and I inherit our sin nature. The reason why a baby, uh, 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 just an infant baby can can, uh, uh, can lie. You say, how in the world do babies lie? Well, try this out, moms and dads, grandmas and grandpas. You're laying asleep at night, and everything's quiet. That baby's quiet. And all of a sudden, you hear a, a squall like a panther. Ah! Oh, somebody's stealing our child. They've crawled through the window. Something awful. There's, a, there's an animal, wild animal, killing our child. And you go in there, and you open up the door, and they go, you come here. Nothing wrong. You say, why is that? Because we all have a sin nature. I'm not going to ask you how many had to teach your kids not to lie. Because every parent, if you have any sense, has to teach your child not to lie. You say, why? Because it's innate. It's in them. And so we understand that, uh, that nobody gets by with that. Nobody is sinlessly perfect. And, and by that, way, it will be a wonderful day when you realize that you're not as good as you think you are. All of us. Get your nose out of the clouds. You're a sinner saved by grace. We're all sinners. We're born that way. Then we have not just the nature of sin, but the naming of sin. And by the way, he names his sin. And can I say that there are times, by the way, we in America, we need to get back to naming sin again. I just happened to pull out a list. Man, there's sin all through the Bible. God deals with sin. I thought, well, you're not going to read the Bible, so I just pulled something down. Here's one. Disobedience, drunkenness, self-worship, sodomy, homosexuality, incest, lying. It's all in the Bible. Amen? Deceit, hatred, plotting murder, idolatry, murmuring, uh, rebellion, covetousness, uh, intruding in the priest's office, taking bribes, pride, eating blood, jealousy, uh, witchcraft, uh, adultery, rape. Division, mockery, human sacrifice, despising God's word, scattering the sheep, self-will, prayerlessness, uh, teaching false doctrine, lack of mercy, hypocrisy, denying Christ, polluting the house of God, uh, being stiff-necked, blasphemous, uh, unthankful, boasting, disobedient to parents, lacking natural affection, uh, living in the flesh. I go on and on and on and on. This book right here tells us we're sinners. And you and I need to understand, sometimes we just go through, go through a week's time and we never get on our knees. We never ask God to forgive us of our sins because we all think we're pretty good. Let me just tell you right now, you and I ought to regularly confess our sin so it doesn't take root down inside of us. There is a nature and sin of all of us. There is a naming of sin. And can I say, there ought to come a time in your life when you're on your face for God that you name your sin. Stop this blanket endorsement stuff. Oh, Lord, forgive me my sins. Start naming them. Tell God what you did wrong. Let him break you of that. Jesus Christ hung on the cross and died for our sins. 
Not just the name of sin, but the acknowledgement of sin. Look what he says. He says, uh, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is there before. What does that mean? When, we, when God discovers your sin, he immediately sets in motion a series of actions that come straight from heaven and it's intended to get you to repent. Well, this is what I'm getting ready to say. Don't miss this. Let me give you just a pattern before I get into this. If you have a good mom and you have a good dad, whenever you're a child, and that, that mom and that dad, they see you do something wrong, they see you disobey, a good mom and a good dad will set in action a series of things to get you right in that sin. Our Heavenly Father does the same thing. I want you to kind of write these down. I don't think we have them up here. Let me just show you this, some of these. Uh, first of all, one of those things is this, the matter of conviction. You ought to write that down somewhere. God begins to convict our heart. That means he begins to use those goads uh, uh, to, uh, to punch away at our heart and, and different things begin to occur. He says this. He said, my sin is ever before me. What does that mean? Your, your mind and your heart has the ability to visualize things from time to time. And God, through the Holy Spirit of God, will take you back and you'll kind of, something will flash around or something will remind you of that thing. And what God is doing through conviction is trying to get you back to get you to fix that thing. And that will happen over and over and over and over again until the Holy Spirit becomes a little quiet about that. Sometimes God uses uh, your knowledge of what the Bible says about your sin in order to convict you. In other words, make you feel guilty about that. And, Maybe it's the Ten Commandments. Uh, maybe it's adultery. And, and over and over you're reminded as a Christian, thou shalt not commit adultery. And maybe you have not committed adultery physically, but you watch it on the smutty television set. And it's just the same as, as being involved in it according to God. You know, how in the world are we ever going to have revival in America when we can't shut the TV off when some of that smut's going on? May heaven help us today. I'm simply saying that the Holy Spirit of God, by the way, may, may the Holy Spirit of God convict you the next time you pop that set on and don't turn it off. And I'm just saying today that, that uh, conviction comes and sometimes it comes by Bible knowledge and the Holy Spirit throws it in our mind's eye and that still fall, small voice begins to whisper. Sometimes God uses a preacher to preach on your sin like maybe that's what's going on right now. That's what happened to David. God told Nathan, Get down there and deal with him. Everybody's scared of David, but you, now you go tell him what he did. By the way, can I just stop and say this? Preaching, a preacher preaching on sin is not a bad thing. It's a good thing. It's a very good thing. And I will tell you this, we need a nation one more time where the preacher rears back on his hind legs and lets her fly. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about everybody. I say, I say, preachers out there that won't preach on sin, you're chicken. You're not helping America. You're not helping families. There might be some sweet little wife that needs to hear that uh, for, for her husband. There may be some husband that, that maybe needs to hear that for their wife. They, there may be some uh, couple getting ready to get married. They understand how adultery and some of this other stuff can ruin their marriages. Amen, preacher. I'm just saying today we need, a, we need a man like Nathan and sometimes God uses a preacher man to come and help us with that. Sometimes it is a friend or family member that will confront you about your sin and conviction uh, seeps in and thank God for that. Sometimes it may be circumstances that will cause you to recall your sin. I'm just saying all of this is so that you'll be convicted and shamed and you feel guilty about that. You say, does God do that? Yes, he does. And you ought to thank God for it. I know, what you, I know what you're getting out there in America. Light diet Christianity. Let's don't feel guilty about nothing. Let's just don't, let's don't have any shame anymore. Everything's just free and love, and you see what's happening in America. He will wear you out with conviction because he loves you, and he knows what's coming if you don't deal with your sin. Listen, he knows what's coming. If you're here today and without Jesus Christ, I'm going to tell you what's going to happen with your sin. If you don't get it under the blood as a Christian, you'll die and burn in hell. God knows that. That's why conviction comes in services like this. That's why the Holy Spirit of God works on you to come to Christ because God knows what's coming. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. There's not a loving God that sends people to hell. We go to hell because we choose to go there. The Bible says that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels, and we only go there because we refuse to trust Jesus Christ as our Savior. 
And even worse than that, he knows what's coming for the Christian that chooses not to listen to the conviction. He knows it's going to result in loss of power. He knows it's going to result in loss of rewards. He knows, he knows God knows his chasing hand is going to have to come in on, in on that person. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6, Whom the Lord loveth, he chaseth and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. You ought to thank God for that. I was raised by an old-fashioned mom, an old-fashioned dad, and I knew what the maple switch was. I knew what the belt was. And some of you sat back there saying, well, you know, that's just child abuse. Well, they got by with it. And I thank God for it. My dad's back there sweating now. Boy, I hope it's past the statute of limitations. It was, Dad. They know what that was back then. Number two, not just a discovery of sin. That's the starting place, but the dealing with sin. The dealing with sin. Verse number five, he says, he says, uh, verse, number, verse, verse number four, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shaped in iniquity of sin by my dear mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts. Three quick things about this. First of all, as we deal with sin, we've got to recognize that our sin is against the Lord. Look at verse 4. Read that first phrase with me together. Ready? Verse 4. Ready? Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. In thy sight. Listen to me. God doesn't miss a thing. The first thing we need to do is when we're dealing with sin, we need to recognize that all of our sins are against God first. We sin against mankind, but it's a trespass against God first. Then we ought to repent of that sin, telling God what you have done. That's what David is doing this entire psalm. This is a psalm of prayer and conf of confession and repentance. It turned into a song for Israel to sing. Now, God already knows all about your sin. He's just wanting to hear from you. And then thirdly, we should request God's mercy and forgiveness. Look what he does. Verse 1. Look, look at his request. He says, Have mercy upon me, O God. According to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Erase it. The word blot is a... I, I don't want to get into a bunch of theology here, but the word blot is a word which really kind of connects itself to the blood of Jesus Christ. Cover that with the blood, Lord! The choir was singing just a while ago about his life for mine, and one of the phrases in that song was that we're now dressed in his righteousness. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're born again, you're not dressed in the righteousness of Christ because you're that good. You're dressed in the righteousness and the cloak of Jesus Christ because you're forgiven by the blood of Jesus Christ. And understand today that David is praying. He's pouring his heart out. He says, oh, God, get rid of this sin. It's there before me. Verse number 2, he says, wash my sin away. Clean me up. All these songs we sing in our songbook should take meaning to us. They're not just words on a page. They have meaning behind them. And, and look at this. It's my favorite one. Look at verse number 4. He says, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest, watch this now, to me in the God, that thou mightest be justified. When thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. In other words, speaking of David. And what he's saying is this. David's saying, Lord, I just want you to, I want you to think good of me again. And I have this written down in my notes right here because this is what I want to say. You might want to write this down somewhere. When it comes to sin, let God win. When it comes to the Holy Spirit of God getting down in the inner part and digging around and trying to find that wicked black sin that's about to metastasize to the rest of your soul. Whenever God starts digging with His Word, let God win so that you can be justified in His eyes one more time so you can be pleased with your life one more time. Be clear. Confession and cleansing makes us wiser. Verse 6 says, Behold, thou desires truth in inner parts. In the hidden part, thou shalt make me to know wisdom. You ever heard this phrase? You ever heard someone say, uh, they're just world wise? By the way, some of you here today that you're out in the world and sin stains your life, but 
Jesus saved you, and now you're watching other people go down the same path. And but you know better. You're world wise, and that's a hard, that's a hard thing to obtain. And I wouldn't want anybody to obtain it. But you see others that they just haven't figured it out. And I think about how you've got the scars of sin, and and you've been taught by the scars of sin by the Spirit of God that don't commit that sin anymore. Maybe it's alcoholism. Maybe it was some other particular sin, but. You say that you've got cleaned up and you don't want to go that anymore. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Some of you need to, some of you here today, you need to let an old sinner like that that's repented come alongside you and put their arm around you and tell you, son, you don't want to go down that path. I've, I've done that. I pay the price. The price is too high. You don't want to do that. And then I wrote this third thing down. We see the delight of a clean heart. Now, you're going to have to, don't, don't leave me on this. I'm going to throw a little Bible out here and a little theology for those of you who want something deeper. So I want you to listen carefully. I'm going to make this as practical as I can. Look at verse number 7. He says, he says God, in my prayer, he said, Everyone, want you, he, he said, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. That's symbolic. Let me explain to you what that means. Purge me with hyssop. This is a beautiful picture of how sweet God's forgiveness is to a repentant heart. Hyssop was an aromatic plant used in the Bible for three things. First of all, it's fragrance. It smelled really, really good. And back in Bible days, you were looking for anything that smelled good because people didn't take a bath for a long, long time. And it was hot and moving on. It was used also, secondly, as a cleanser. And it was also used as an applicator, like a brush. They would bunch together the tops uh, of these hyssop tops, and they'd form a sort of a paintbrush, and then the stem itself would become branchy when it was dried, and it'd be used as an extension to a newly formed paintbrush. It depends on where you cut that off. You'll hear it talked about hyssop was used to apply the blood to the doorpost during the Passover. Hyssop was used to reach the sponge filled with vinegar to the lips of our Savior. And I don't have time to tell you what that meant. But it had to do with that wicked black sin down in the inner parts today. As a fragrance, as a fragrance, hyssop was mashed up. And that oozing juice that would come out of those flowers were added to what was called the ashes of the red heifer in the Old Testament. Now, this is deep, and some of you just kind of just hang with me. Numbers 19. Along with, you can look at the additives, was the fragrance of cedar wood. Scarlet was added to this combination. Remember now, for all you old-timers here, and you know a little bit about lye soap, soap is made from wood ashes and the fat of beef. That was the base for the soap bar. These ashes were to be added to pure water, which was formed by what was called the water of separation. And these ashes formed a very, very sweet-smelling, soapy substance that would literally clean. But as David was using here in this particular verse, it also was used symbolically to purge away sin and separate an individual that was as clean before God. And here is the action. They would take that water separation, they pure water, they'd put those ashes down in there, they'd make that soapy substance, they'd apply the hyssop to that, and they would sprinkle it on things that were ha, had said, we want this to be clean, we want this to be clean. The priest had to do that. The houses had to be like that. If anybody touched a dead body, they had to. It was all symbolic. Naturally, could have literally cleansed themselves with that soapy substance, but it was symbolic. David says here, purge me with that hyssop. Clean me up. The repentance of sin is like a nice hot bath with sweet-smelling soap purging away the sweat and dirt of the day. Physically, spiritually, we need to remember that we are clay. We're dirt. Because of our sin, 
We have to daily labor and sweat. Genesis 3.19, the sweat of thy face, thou shalt eat bread till thou return on the ground. For out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. Let me tell you why that's like that. Let me tell you why that's like that. Because Adam and Eve sinned. When David said, purge me with hyssop, O God, he was crying out for his cleansing so that he would once again feel fresh and cleansed and purged of his sin. He didn't want God to see his dirt anymore. His filth. That can only happen when we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. First John 1, 9, if we confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You see, God doesn't beat you over head with a big stick when we sin. The only thing He wants is us to repent of that. Confess it. He wants to dab that, you might say, sweet, aromatic fragrance of His hyssop down into the beautiful, smelling water of His separation and clean you up. His hyssop is not a baseball bat. His hyssop is forgiveness. It's sweet. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. And if you don't believe that, look at the proof. Verse 8, David said, Make me hear joy and gladness. The bones which thou hast broken, that's the Lord judging him. The bones that thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. He was saying here, he's saying, Make me hear joy again, Lord. Put a song back in my heart. Make me feel glad again. Put a smile back on my face. And ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you what repentance happens when you go down to the inward parts. Whenever you say yes about your sin, like Jesus says about your sin, here's what happens. Sin brings a new day, a joyous day. A wonderful day when we repent when we repent of our sin. And all of it happens way down deep in the inward parts where nobody else can see. David repented of his wicked sins of adultery and murder and lying. He confessed them. I understand that repentance happens in the inward parts when you decide that you're going to break with sin and come clean before God. Confession is the outward sign of that repentance. Restitution is an outward sign of that. Restitution is not repentance. Reparation or repairing some damaged relationship, again, is an outward sign of what you let God do down deep in your heart. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn for the wicked ways. Then will I hear from heaven. And he's waiting. His eyes are watching. His ears are attentive. I've never been there, but they tell me there's a place up in Labrador, Canada, named Walbush, Canada. For many, many years, it was a remote town. You had to get to it by horseback or foot. And back in the 80s, I believe it was, they finally, the state finally put a road into the wilderness to get to Walbush. One road in, one road out. They ta say it takes, depends on what type of vehicle you're using, six to eight hours to drive back to that town. You go in the same way, you come out the same way. One way in, one way out. And the only way in, the only way out is you've got to get in there. When you make the decision, you're ready to come home, you turn around. Each of us by birth arrive at a place called sin, a city, a town called sin, just like this town in Canada. One way in, one way out. But God built a road in there. And the only thing you've got to do down deep in that inner part is say, today, I'm done. I'm coming home. Turn it around. That's what repent means. Turn it around. Today, if you're without Christ, turn around. Come to Jesus. 
today if you're a Christian, which, by the way, that word repentance is used a whole lot more for God's people in the Bible. And I'm telling you, turn it around. You say, well, America needs to turn around. No, we're Americans. We need, well, the church needs to turn around. No, we're part of the church. Turn it around. Well, I will when something. No, no, it's not about anybody else. It's about down deep in your inward parts. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. What is it? Down there that nobody knows. Nobody knows but God. What's it going to take to dig that out? I'm going to tell you. It'll start with the Word of God, Holy Spirit of God. Sometimes a preacher may touch on it. Sometimes a friend or family member may touch on it. Sometimes some circumstance will flash before your eyes. I will tell you that God's working. But I'm going to tell you where it's going to end up. It's going to end up, if you don't deal with it, God's going to deal with it. God's going to deal with it. And that's what's happening to our nation right now. Sir, ma'am, I'd rather you deal with it, then God has to deal with it. Let's stand to our feet, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I understand the nature of the message today, but I also understand if we're ever going to have revival, we've got to start somewhere, and this is where we start today. The heads bowed, our eyes closed. You know what's going on. Maybe it's the name of a person that's coming to you right now. Maybe it's an action that you committed that you've never made it right with God. Another relationship. Maybe it's just old pride and it's just building and you're just right now, you're just saying, hey, oh, I hear that. That's just preaching. That's all that is. Yeah. And you just hang on one more time while you just get colder and colder and colder for an almighty God. Come on, folks are coming right now. I want you just, just go ahead and break. Just turn it around. Now, folks, today, listen carefully. Life is too short. Hold bitterness or grudge or leave sin unconfessed. Would you let God do a, the perfect work in the inward parts? You don't need, I'm not the Pope. You don't come and confess to me. You don't have to say nothing to anybody. It's the Pope's business. Would you let God work right now? Say, preacher, if I break on this thing right here, I mean, it's just going to, it's going to, people won't think I'm weak. Well, who really cares? I'd rather have the power of God and the blessing. I'd rather have cleansing. I'd rather put a smile back on my face and a song back in my heart than worry about what somebody thinks. Today, if you're here without Christ, you're in the best place you can be to come to Him. Why don't you come to Jesus? We have somebody on the end of each aisle with a Bible in their hand. If you're not sure the heaven's your home, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. Just come on. Father, bless in this invitation. Speak to hearts today. Father, someone's lost. Help them to break and come. Help them to come back that, up that road that you built in there to them through the cross of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. We'll sing.